not get feedback. All right, let's see. Let's see if Aaron's on. So Yasmin, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. All right, great. We've got it all set up in the big ballroom and with no feedback. It's good. All right. It's just Jeff, yeah, perfect. Gotta love that secretariat. <laughs> They've been magnificent. So Okay, right. should we start? I think we can, I think we can start. Yeah. We good, everybody? Thumbs up. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Greetings. A very warm welcome to you all uh, to our roundtable discussion. It's great to see you here today. So I thank you for joining us both in person for those sitting in the ballroom and those online. I especially welcome all our consortium colleagues uh, from Babsicle, Hillnet, the Law Society uh, Pro Bono Services from Singapore, UNDP, the Thomson Reuters Foundation and uh, Trust Law, the Global Pro Bono Bar Association, the International Bridges uh, to Justice, the Center for Reproductive Rights, Gongam, and last but not least, the Legal Empowerment Network. I do hope I've not uh, left anyone out. Um, I'd like to make a special, extra special mention to Julia from Hillnet, Janita and Nandita from Trust Law, Kevin from the Law Society of Singapore, uh, Pilku from Gom GAM, and of course, Bruce from Babsicle for collaborating with us on this particular round table. Now, I shall be moderating the session today, and I'm really delighted to say that we have a really great panel who are going to be setting the scene. So let me introduce myself first of all. I'm Yasmin Batliwala, Chief Executive at Babix for International Development, uh, or A4ID as we're also known. Um, we provide pro bono legal services, working in partnership with international law firms and also uh, develop the development sector organizations. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are at the very heart of what we do. Now, the theme for today's roundtable is institutionalizing pro bono to help achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, and the ESGs in Asia. I'm really looking forward, not only to hearing what our speakers have to say, but also what you, our participants, have to say about this agenda, and importantly, your role within it. But before we progress, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction whatsoever, Bruce Lasky. Bruce is going to give you more information about these roundtables, their purpose, and how you can get involved, and indeed what the next roundtable is all about. So over to you, Bruce. Okay, so thank you, Yasmin, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here um, with everybody virtually and uh, plus plus. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to give a bit of a background because this the theme this session is about, uh, uh, the theme this year for the conference is about institutionalizing pro bono and access to justice systems. And these round tables, these quarterly pro bono round tables have been a, a, a real testament to this happening. Um, the idea of using round tables to uh, assist in growing pro bono is not new. This has been going on for a very long while. Uh, there are many, many strategies to do this. Uh, Roundtables are one, clearing houses are another, um, and so many other ways, referral services and such. Um, but a number of years ago, as part of the uh, Asia Pro Bono Conference, uh, we, uh, we, we realized that 
people needed to have a better understanding of what roundtables are and how they can be used to grow pro bono, whether it's roundtable in a, in, a, in a town or a city or a national roundtable or even a regional roundtable. So what we started to do with the Asia Pro Bono Conference was we started to have specific sessions focusing on how to develop roundtables. By memory, I think the first one was done in Malaysia, um, but I'm probably wrong about that. Um, <laughs> and from that, from that time on, we continuously had sessions focusing on roundtables. At the same time, roundtables were going on countrywide and even uh, a bit regionally. And a couple of years ago, uh, PeelNet and the Law Society Pro Bono Services uh, reached out to a number of us and, and said, hey, this was uh, the beginning of COVID and uh, said, hey, how about we all do a round table um, regionally? You know, we, we can organize something. It was First, it was kind of between Hong Kong and Singapore, but we had other inputs. Um, and that's when we came up with the idea that really this needs to be institutionalized. So we started with a few partners um, and we grew it um, and we came to a decision all together that we would have these roundtables meet quarterly. Um, they would have different thematic topics. We would increase the cons pro bono roundtable consortium members, which we did from the first year to the next year and now now. Um, and this roundtable is an example of it. So the roundtables meet four times a year. That's why they're quarterly, four times. <laughs> But we also agreed that one of the roundtables would always meet when we have the Asia Pro Bono Conference. And then the other three would meet at other times. So this is the third one of the year. We're really excited to be a part of it. There is the fourth one, and I'm briefly gonna pass this briefly over to Marlon Manuel, who's with the Legal Empowerment Network for about 30 seconds or so, because they're organizing another one in November uh, along with a consortium partner, uh, UNDP. And that's how it's done. Different consortium partners take the lead on some of the roundtables. Uh, uh, A4ID, Babsicle, Gongam, uh, L Law Society, Pro Bono Services. We're, I think we're the core partners. Pionet's come in and supported uh, Thompson Reuters for this one. But we take, uh, we split up responsibilities and we collaboratively do it together. So with that, Marlon, for maybe 30 seconds, and then we're going to pass this back to Yasmin to go forward with today's roundtable. Yes. Marlon, uh, uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, this is just a, a quick announcement that uh, and uh, and wait for uh, more details. We will be having the, the last quarter roundtable uh, focusing on environmental justice. Uh, so this discussion on uh, SDG ESG is a good uh, segue to the next uh, roundtable, which where we will be discussing land, natural resources, environmental justice, community power in deciding what happens to their land and environment. That's it, wait for further announcements. Thank you, back to you, Bruce. Okay, and just briefly at the end of this, um, all of you that are attending will then be on this quarterly roundtable list, and we ask you to, you know, please join it. And also, we'll be looking to expand the consortium partners. Um, there are responsibilities that you need to take on. You have to promote it. You have to be willing to organize. You have to be willing to, you know, do all this together. But it really is a positive, positive labor of love. And I can tell you, these roundtables absolutely work. And with that, I'm passing it back to Yasmin. Thank you all very much. And let's take this forward. Thank you, Bruce. And just to confirm, it is fun for no other reason that you meet some absolutely amazing people. Um, also, audience, you're all sending us little messages. So thanks very much indeed. Hello to all of you. Um, now, going back then to our agenda for today, I am assuming that most of you know what the SDGs are, but for those of you who don't and who need a reminder, uh, they were agreed and formalized in 2015 by the United Nations. Indeed, all 193 member states have adopted the SDGs as the organizing framework for global cooperation on development. Their purpose was very much to reset the direction of the world economy from one of the widening inequalities and social inclusion. And this also included, of course, the great threats to our environment and biodiversity 
uh, to move it to a trajectory of sustainable development and a world where prosperity is shared, where societies are inclusive and where the environment is kept safe. At the time, this was a radical agenda demanding radical change. And the SDGs are part of what is known as the 2030 Agenda. Now, all of these aspirations are linked in some way, obviously, to the law and the way that lawyers work. So, with less than eight years until the 2030 deadline, it's absolutely vital that the legal community involved in this agenda and importantly plays its part. So, within the SDG framework, we also have the ESGs. Increasingly, the focus is being placed on businesses to ensure compliance of the ESGs. Where the ESGs are the guiding principles, the ESGs should comply together, they complement each other in respect to what they can achieve. The role of pro bono here is even more prominent as it has a dual function of meeting requirements whilst also encouraging responsible business by setting compliance standards. Our panel are going to unpack some of the complexities and share their experiences of how the legal world is having to adopt and embrace the SDGs and ESGs agenda. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our fabulous panel. Our first panelist is Vish Chowdhury. Vish is A4ID's project lead for South Asia. He is based in Delhi and has a keen interest in development and indeed is very passionate about reducing inequalities and poverty. Vish has a keen interest in constitutional law, criminal law, professional ethics and international law. He's published in these areas as well as spoken on a number of international conferences on each of these areas of practice. Vish was also an assistant professor and assistant director at Jindal Global University. So very welcome, Vish. Our next panelist is Zay Wei, NG, who joins us from Hong Kong. Jay is a, uh, Zay Wei is a lawyer specialized in philanthropy and ESG within the private wealth department of Stevenson Harwood uh, from Hong Kong. With nearly a decade of experience in the NGO sector, she has knowledge of charitable uh, uh, charities and also social innovation. Indeed, she speaks regularly and writes about strategic philanthropy and ESG developments. She's also been very active in shaping her firm's CSR and pro bono program as co-lead for, uh, for the Hong Kong program. She sits on boards of several NGOs, including Resolve and her firm in Hong Kong. She's a founding board member of the International Lawyer Group Global Alliance for, of Impact Lawyers, otherwise known as Gale. And she's also the founding uh, director of the Hong Kong office uh, for PillNet, the global network for public interest law. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Yu Jung Qin. Yu Jung is a lawyer and is based in Seoul. She worked for the government in communication and cooperation with the international human rights mechanism, mainly UN treaty bodies. She's also participated in domestic decision processes on different human rights concerns. These include an inter-ministerial discussion to address the negative impact of the Korean companies operating in Southeastern Asia. Her government work, um, has provided, as a result of that work, she's provided counsel to a few transnational corporations about their concerns in managing their supply chains and anti-discrimination policy in the workplace, as well as the health and safety issues of the workers. She's also participated in research projects, including Comparative Guide for uh, SMEs on uh, 
uh, ESG laws. Currently, she works as a litigator. So welcome you, Jim. And so that is the panel. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of experience between all of them. But before they speak and tell you all about the SDGs, we're gonna have a little bit of fun and find out what you know about the SDGs. And so we've prepared a quiz, especially for you, with Vish as the quiz master. So over to you, Vish. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And I am going to take um, some of Bruce's enthusiasm, uh, which I dare say is quite infectious. So let's see. Uh, I hope everybody's sitting hot on their seats and you've had your morning coffee wherever you are. And it gives me immense pleasure to be uh, welcoming you to this session. Uh, but I think before we do that, because a lot of us are joining online, uh, I would like you to warm up your fingers because that's where we will be uh, playing a lot of the quiz. So if you can just raise your hand and warm up your fingers and be ready to type on either your phones or on indeed your laptops and that would be amazing and we are going to start uh, with a few basic questions and then we're going to go to some advanced ones uh, i think we can all agree amongst ourselves that we will give you the honor of being the winner of this quiz although sadly uh, there are no prizes uh, but the knowledge itself is a big prize uh, so let's start with a somewhat easy question and i expect everybody to know the answer to this uh, so are you all ready if you're all ready can you give me a thumbs up either um, Put a thumbs up or if you can use the chat function here like so like i've given myself a thumbs up all right i would like to see a few more thumbs up come on i've heard a lot about the audience and i have seen them interacting very nicely uh great great so i do see a few more thumbs up uh, which is very very heartening thank you very much to all of you uh right so the first question are you all ready all right. Okay. Question number one, and this is an easy one. What is the full form of SDG? What is the full form of SDG? So if you can type in the chat box, that will be great. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. All right. No trick questions there. No surprises there. Excellent. Jonita has got it right. Medha Dio has got it right. Cherry's got it right. Uh, Naseem's got it right. Uh, Nina's got it right. Amazing, amazing. So that's absolutely correct. The full form is SVGs. And if you've got it right, which I think a lot of you have, uh, give yourself a thumbs up or a pat on the back and uh, let us then move on. All right. Uh, the second question is slightly uh, more personal and you'll have to apply your brains a little bit more. So here's the second question. In your current role, are you using SDGs? This is a yes, no, maybe option. So three options is yes, is yes, you are using SDGs. Uh, the second is maybe you're using SDGs and the third is no, you're not using SDGs. All right, great. That's really heartening. I am monitoring the chat box. There has not been, there's one no, all right, and mostly yeses, and we've got 100%, which is really what we like to hear. All right, so I think um, I'll give you maybe five more seconds to just tell me uh, what in, in case you are using SDGs in your roles. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's move on to a slightly more nuanced question, uh, which is, uh, again, it's not a trick question, but to which country are ES, uh, sorry, SDGs applicable? That is the question for today. Which countries are SDGs applicable? The options are A, all of them, B, the European Union countries, C, the underdeveloped countries, or D, none of them. We all know there's one definite wrong in there. All right. Great. I think we are, again, uh, making good progress because uh, it says all of them. In fact, uh, so many has also gone with the exact number, which is 193. Um, dare I say, your all, all your knowledge is 
really, really impressive and uh, makes me very happy, but also slightly uncomfortable because uh, I might be out of my job soon if you keep answering such brilliantly. All right, great. So yes, absolutely. SDGs, uh, we've established the full form is sustainable development goals. Uh, most of you are using them, uh, or at least maybe using them, and they are applicable to all of the countries around the world. And 193 is the number that has been established also by Tun Tun O. All right, great. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, how many SDGs are there? Any guesses for this? How many SDGs are there? 17, says Cherry. 17, says Marlon. 17, 17, 17. All right. Okay, I'll give you another 30 seconds to uh, say how many there are. All right. Okay, most of you have got it also right. Well done. Again, a pat on your back. Uh, but you know what? Let me make it slightly... Uh, slightly harder and let's delve deeper into the goals themselves. Maybe uh, that'll, that'll give you a bit more context. All right, so the, this is how I'm going to do it. We've all established SDGs are sustainable development goals. A lot of you are using them uh, and there are 17 in all. They're applicable to all the countries around the world. Now, what I want you to do is when I say the goal number, I want you to type out what the goal is. So that should take you about seven seconds. And then if you're using that in your work, if that is a goal that is particularly being used in your work, I want you to give me a thumbs up like this, like I've just done. And if you're maybe using it, I want you to give me a heart like this. And if you're not using it, I want you to give me an open mouth like this. All right, clear? If you're using it, thumbs up. If you're maybe using it, you know, you're thinking from your heart, you give me your heart. And if you're not using it, give me a surprise face because you really are not doing it. All right, so is, is it clear to everybody? Okay. All right, now who is going to tell me what is goal number one? Please type it in the chat function. I think Erin has... Um, beaten everybody to it. It is no poverty. Cherry says no poverty. Jason, uh, Neema, Nicole, everybody says no poverty. You're absolutely correct. Uh, goal number one being no poverty. So now give me your reaction. If you're using it, maybe you're using it, not using it. All right, we've got some reactions. Come on, guys, keep them coming. Uh, I suppose if you are joining physically, I'll use um, uh, Bruce's expert eyes to see how people are either giving a thumbs up, patting on their heart, or opening their mouths in surprise. Okay, so a lot of you seem to be using it, which is good to hear, and some of you are uh, not really using it, which is what uh, part of the discussion in the panel would be how uh, you can perhaps start using it. All right. By the way, there are no right or wrong answers. Um, I mean, of course, I think there are right or wrong answers, but uh, not, not, not this early on in the day. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, who's going to tell me what is goal number two? Goal number two. All right. I think Irene, again, seems to be the first one to answer, and it is zero hunger. So when Nemi uh, and others are also following, absolutely. Absolutely, the second goal is zero hunger. Uh, I'll give another five seconds or so. Absolutely wonderful. All right, this is zero hunger. That's goal number two. Now, again, the same exercise. If you're using it, maybe you're using it. You're not using it. And if I can have some reactions, please. Okay, some of you seem to be using it. That's good. Again, uh, Bruce, I'll, I'll be relying on his expert eyes to check out uh, what happens in the great ballroom. And perhaps we can have some feedback from there later on towards the end of the quiz. And uh, all right, great. I have had uh, some reactions. Okay, this is a slightly longer one. Goal number three, who's going to give me goal number three 
first. Okay. Samantha, excellent. Samantha is the first one to give. Salat, McDowell again. Uh, Miss Jana, Irene, good health and well being. Absolutely. And the importance of this, I suppose, has really been compounded by the pandemic. Uh, and this is something that many of us seem to be aware of. Excellent. Again, same exercise. All right, some are using it. And I think this is also something that most of us are uh, personally uh, using in our daily life. So I think I expect a lot more hearts here as well as a lot more thumbs up. Okay, I've got a few thumbs up. Excellent. Few hearts. Brilliant. All right. Goal number four. Some might say we are working towards goal number four here as well. So it'll be interesting. Absolutely. Quality education, uh, that is goal number four. Uh, and I would request you again to uh, do the same exercise, heart, open mouth. Okay, few thumbs up. I think a lot of people seem to be using this one. All right, excellent. Uh, goal number five, anybody, gender equality, absolutely, Salak, that is correct. Uh, gender equality, a very, very uh, important goal as well. Uh, and again, the same exercise for everybody. Thumbs up, heart, mouth. Okay, all right, I'm going to speed up slightly because you all seem to be doing exceptionally well. Uh, so I am going to go to the next goal which is goal number six. Absolutely clean water and sanitation. That is correct. Again, the same exercise. All right. You know what? I'm actually going to make it slightly harder. I am going to start with random goal numbers because I think that might uh, throw you off. So here we are. Goal number 15. Goal number 15, please. Life on land, absolutely. Absolutely, Tip, that is correct. Life on land. Again, uh, your reactions, please. Thumbs up, heart, or surprised, open mouth. Okay, excellent. Goal number 13. Goal number 13, please. Climate action, absolutely. Absolutely, Samantha, correct. Jay, and again, the same reactions, please. Okay, all right. Goal number 14, anyone? Goal number 14. We've talked about land. We've talked about climate change. No guesses for what? Yes, absolutely. Life below water, that is correct. Uh, goal number 16. Again, the same reactions, please. All right. Goal number seven, please. You seem to be getting this as well. My uh, little technique of mixing them up hasn't seemed to throw you off. So maybe I'll have to make my questions a bit harder. Well, we shall see. Uh, goal number eight. Goal number eight, please. All right. Goal number nine. Same thing, please. Uh, heart, thumbs up, or surprise face. Okay, all right. You know what, I'm really uh, actually quite pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of you are using uh, them and are able to make the connections. So that's really, really good. Uh, goal number 10. Goal number 10. Absolutely. Reduced inequality. You're correct. Tip. And if you can, again, give me your reactions for goal number 10. Okay, that's brilliant. A lot of you again seem to be using it or at least maybe using it, uh, which I think is an answer for the moment I'll take. Uh, goal number 11. Who's going to tell me goal number 11? All right, okay. 
Uh, similarly with goal 12. All right. And finally, which I think is really something that we are working on as we speak is goal number 17. Goal number 17, please. Partnership, partnerships uh, to achieve the goal. Absolutely. So I think not a single wrong answer. And I am very delighted to see that there is um, a very, very clear understanding so far. All right, let me ask you some more questions. And again, warm up your fingers. And here goes the question. When did the United Nations adopt the SDG goals? What year was this? If you give me uh, perhaps an approximate month, you get uh, brownie points for that, but give me the year at least. 2015, 2015, uh, there's Dr. Anita Shreshta, wonderful. Absolutely, you got it all absolutely correct that it was 2015. Uh, all right, let me ask you another question. When are the goals intended to be met? And this is something that Yasmin has uh, already spoken. So if you've been listening, you will get this right. And a lot of you have been listening. 2030. Excellent. All right, let's do some maths. How many years are left uh, for us to be able to achieve these goals? Absolutely. 2030 is when we are to achieve them. And considering it is 2022, we've got how many years left to achieve these goals? I see uh, Yasmin has been giving everybody prompts. Absolutely, that is eight years. Uh, you are absolutely correct. We've got eight years to achieve the goals, uh, which is what we are uh, really going to be talking about a little bit more in the session. Uh, all right, I think I'll ask you maybe a few more questions and uh, uh, please do stop me as when if you think I seem to have been carried away, but I am getting really good responses. So I will ask maybe two more questions. All right, each SDG is supported by a set of targets, uh, as, as Yasmin also said uh, in the beginning. How many targets are there in total? So this is a slight trick question. Uh, I think you, all of you seem to be slightly complacent now, which is when I attack. I'm not asking you how many goals there are. I'm asking you how many targets there are. All right. Okay. And I have to say that um, uh, earlier Yasmin was able to prompt with her fingers saying eight years to go. She doesn't have as many fingers uh, and no one of us does. So let us hear from you. How many targets are there? Absolutely. Uh, there are 169 targets, which we are going to be talking about a little bit more during our, 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 our presentations. All right. All right. Okay. One last question. I promise this is the last one. And this is really a crucial one. So please, again, warm up your fingers, warm up your minds. And here goes the question. Who can play a role in achieving SDGs? And this is a multiple choice. Uh, so please listen uh, before you answer. Who can play a role in achieving SDGs? Option A, government. Option B, civil society. Option C, citizens, and option B, all of the above. I'll repeat the question, who can play a role in achieving SDGs? Option A, governments, option B, civil society, option C, citizens, option D, all of them. Excellent. I think we see a lot of Ds. Absolutely. It is all of the above because it is for the government, uh, the civil society, as well as citizens to come together uh, to play their full role in achieving the SDGs. Uh, so absolutely wonderful. I think you all have been really, really knowledgeable, uh, which is very, very heartening. And I am sure I will see a lot of you during the course of the other presentations that we have. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this quiz, which for me was a lot of fun. I hope it was the same for you. Uh, and with that, I pass it back to you, Yasmin.
Well, thank you so much, Bish. Um, thank you all for participating in that quiz. Uh, we did give you, I did give you right at the very beginning, all sorts of hints. So uh, uh, the fact that you all got them right seems to indicate that all of you were listening or actually uh, knew all the answers, so brilliant. Um, so now I have some questions for the panel. Uh, so starting with you, Vish, um, please tell us a little bit more about the SDGs. Uh, can you please provide us with the context of what the SDGs are, their importance and the current status in terms of their implementation within the region? Also, can you please highlight the business case for the SDGs? Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. And I think I am going to uh, switch my hat from the quiz master to actually answering these questions. And uh, I think the context, as we uh, just talked about, uh, so the SDGs, uh, you know, the UN uh, Sustainable Goals that we just established, all 17 of them uh, are a universal call to action to end poverty, uh, to protect the planet and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Uh, and they're also known as Agenda 2030. Uh, and they were, as we uh, you know, discussed, uh, decided in 2015, and they are to be met by uh, 2030. And this was decided by the United Nations General Assembly and has been adopted by all United Nations member states. Um, and these, uh, compared to the previously uh, Millennium Development Goals, which were the MDGs, uh, they are their successor and they cover more ground uh, with more ambitions to cover inequalities, climate change, economic growth, decent jobs, cities, industrializations, oceans, ecosystems, energy, sustainable consumption and production, peace and justice. And that was a bit of the theory for SDGs, but I think now is really when, um, and this is what I feel very strongly about, and this is also where uh, I think the heart comes into the SDGs because they are a lot of um, things about the SDGs which are very, very crucial to note and to remember at all times. So I think the first thing I'd say about the SDGs is that this is a very, very ambitious project and there's a very, very ambitious agenda. Uh, I mean, just the sheer nature of it in the sense that as we discussed, it covers all the countries across the world. It is an extremely, extremely ambitious agenda. And if you look at the ground that they cover, uh, starting from equality, all the way to climate change, all the way to uh, partnership. So you see that the ground uh, that the SDGs covers is very, very wide. And it is extremely, extremely, uh, you know, it's just a very, very uh, ambitious agenda. But you know what, I also think, and this is something that we at AFOID believe very, very strongly, that ambitious as it might be, it is also perhaps the best opportunity we've ever had. And we are really a generation uh, which can make a difference. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, positive spin on it. But if we look at it more, uh, you know, the other way you see that the climate change and we perhaps will be the last generation which can make a difference and continues uh, to make a difference as well. So the SDGs in that sense are very, very timely. And they're also something that needs to be uh, completely in sync with what we do. Uh, the SDGs are something uh, where a lot of the work that we do also feeds into them. So, for instance, uh, picking up what we were discussing yesterday in the opening session about the Kathmandu Declaration, uh, we see that it says uh, that to achieve SDGs, uh, you know, pro bono advice is quite crucial and quite important in that sense. Uh, so ambitious as they might be, they are all interrelated. They're also supportive of each other and complement each other in many ways. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's also crucial that we actually take this call to action uh, because it is really the time to be doing it. We've got the resources in terms of the technology, the capacity building, as well as the technical know-how, uh, but it's also the right time to be looking at them. Now, as far as the implementation is concerned, we do have annual meetings um, uh, you know, there are 232 indicators uh, that tell us about the level or the uh, achievement of various SDGs around the world. 
Uh, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda uh, also provides concrete policies and actions to support the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. And every year, the UN Secretary General publishes a report, uh, which is available where all the targets are documented. Now, how each country does it, and I do understand that we are from a lot of countries from across the globe. Uh, each country has their own way of establishing SDGs, uh, as well as monitoring the implementation of SDGs. But I think one thing for sure uh, that there is, as things stand, a great discrepancy in the way SDGs are uh, done in terms of what SDGs for some countries might be doing exceptionally well on certain SDGs, for instance, SDG 4, but not so well on SDG 16 or SDG 14 uh, goal, which is, um, you know, one of the things that we really need to work towards improving. The second thing also is the uniformity of the application of SDGs using a geographical approach. Uh, so there are some countries where the SDGs are doing uh, uh, really well in certain parts, but in the other parts, they're not doing as well. Uh, so for, for instance, bigger countries particularly are experiencing this problem. Uh, and I think the last thing that you asked was about the business case of SDGs. And I'd like to spend considerable time here, which I think also uh, goes on with the ethos of the panel. I think there are a number of reasons why we need to be speaking and be aware of the SDGs. And the first one of them being uh, that it it really is truly a global community. Uh, when we talk about the SDGs, we're talking about our responsibilities, we're talking about our duties, as well as the change that we can make as a global community. Uh, so that's the ethical side of it. But why lawyers need to be talking about SDGs and why they need to be uh, presenting a business case for it, um, there are a lot of reasons. And the first one being uh, that the clients are really driving the agenda. And we see, for instance, the European Union has been talking about making uh, itself as a continent which is a uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, so we see that the consumer demand for SDGs and their understanding, as well as the consumer demand to push the SDG agenda is very, very strong. So it makes exceptionally good business sense. And we will hear more uh, about ESGs, uh, which I leave uh, to the other panelists to talk about, the experts to talk about on. We see that the SDGs being interlinked are a crucial business, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the emerging business query, uh, which a lot of the clients will have in the near future. So it makes very good business sense. Uh, value competition is just not enough anymore for law firms. And that's why it needs to be something that needs to be done, because really, the clients are driving the agenda. And perhaps most importantly, uh, especially lawyers, they yield such a power that um, they have that extra uh, bit of work that they can possibly do in order to achieve the SDGs at uh, sometimes no extra cost to themselves. Uh, so that I hope somewhat answers your question, uh, Yasmin, although I will uh, perhaps come back to that in a moment. Uh, with that, it's back to you, Yasmin. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bish, for a very comprehensive answer. So moving on, I would like to invite um, Zavi to speak. Um, now, I want to focus much more on the ESGs. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned the ESGs uh, and that they appear to be quite, quite complex. Please, can you explain what the ESGs are and simplify, uh, simplify them for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Yasmin. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm so happy to be here this morning. Um, I wish I'm there in Laos in person. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, is that me or is... No, okay. Right. So um, I'll continue. I just I want to say so. Ha I'm so happy to see a lot of familiar faces and I wish I'm there and I'm so happy to be sharing this panel uh, with all of you. So um, seeing how much fun uh, Fish had, I also want to just throw a question to the audience first. Um, so what do you think ESG are? Can I also um, see what knowledge we have in the room? So maybe we'll start with E. Um, what is E? Environment, maybe some <laughs> things you don't. Um, yes. Well, I see that there's only you, Joe, answering. So maybe this is a little bit trickier. 
Ah, uh, economic, yes. Um, all right, so there are some different answers. Great. Extended, <laughs> yes. Okay, right. So I will review the answer shortly, uh, but um, thanks a lot for all those who share. So we have quite a collection from education to environment to extend it. Um, oh, someone is very eager to give me everything. <laughs> okay, so S, um, someone put social down. Um, any, any other guesses? Any other tickers? The S? Social, social, right. It seems there are, there's more consensus on what S is um, amongst this group. And then G, what is G? Remember SDGs was sustainable development goal. So what would the, the G be here? Ah, okay. <laughs> what was the, it seems like I've thrown some people off. Okay. So I've, I see answers from governance to goals. Okay. So um, we will now find out what exactly um, does ESG stand for. Okay, so let me share screen. Um, right. Can you, is it showing up now? Okay, great. So um, is it full screen? Is it full screen right now? Yes. Okay. So great. So this is actually um, ESG. Let me just see. Sorry. Can you see the screen now? No. Yes, we can. Thank you. Ah, okay. But I can't see the screen. Sorry. Let me just figure out what's happening. Um, so you can see the full screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Hmm, but is they, uh, okay. Right, got it, got it, got it. You might want to put it in presentation mode is the only thing I'd suggest. Yes, that's right. That's really? right to, yes, I'm moving it now. Wait a second. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. Right, okay, so. Does it work now? Is it full presentation mode? Uh, no, it's, it was earlier. It's just gone back. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I may need to do this. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> so, okay. I'll, I'll just have to top off the top of my head because my notes are not showing, but um, it's okay. Let me do this. So um, let me go back to here. Is it okay now? Is it uh, okay now? It's now fine. Okay, it's great. Okay, so resuming. So um, basically, um, as you can see, they, this are, uh, the E and the S and the G. So E standing for environmental, social for um, S for social, and G for governance. Um, first of all, I like to highlight. Um, actually, there's no global definition for ESG, and uh, indeed, it can be very, very complicated because you have you hear ESG a lot now in the news. So, what exactly is ESG? And um, there are definitely ESG issues, right? So. E, e and S and G are so broad, so we can break them down into issues. Um, but there are also two other key ways um, that ESG is used, and that is in relation to regulations and also ESG investing. And I'll go into those in a bit. Um, in terms of issues, um, this is uh, these are some issues highlighted by the uh, United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Um, under environment, you can see climate change, resources, depletion, waste, pollution, uh, deforestation. The issues can be very broad. Social, it covers everything from human rights to modern slavery to child labor, uh, working conditions. Governance, it covers everything from the internal 
uh, of the company for diversity and structure to um, the external, whether there is corruption. But I would like to uh, highlight a way that would perhaps help us better um, remember the E and the S and the G. And they are to think about how we, the way we think about businesses, that we um, no longer um, are happy that they only think about financial return, but we also look at a company's impact. We expect them to look at their impacts on environment, on uh, the people, which I mentioned include their employees, uh, the consumers, uh, as well as the community they work in. And also we expect them um, to, care, uh, to care about uh, their governance, which is the foundational structure for helping them achieve these environmental and social goals. And governance um, is uh, important, therefore, in relation to both E and S and also all the uh, uh, SDGs that we mentioned earlier on. Um, I also uh, earlier uh, talked about regulation. So how, how, how are ESGs used, right? So one uh, way that is used right now and why you're hearing it so much is because there are many more regulations um, around the world that are ESG related now. Sorry? Hello? Hello. Okay. All right. So uh, should I keep going? Um, yes, please. <clears throat> okay. So then, like, for example, I'll give you here the, you see that underneath the ESG, I have given some more examples of, of what the ESG issues are. And these are actually the uh, issues that the Hong Kong regulators look at. So a listed company in Hong Kong now are required uh, to disclose their uh, policies in relation uh, to these aspects, um, emissions, uh, resources, climate change, um, employment, health and safety, et cetera. So you will see that every country, um, perhaps the ESG regulations, if they have it, um, may look at slightly different aspects, but this is also where I, I think as um, business and human rights advocate, uh, human rights access to justice advocates and working with a variety of NGOs working in the human rights and environmental space that we can help our government uh, do better in their ESG regulations as to what issues they should look at. Okay, so, um, so mapping the ESG versus the SDG. So um, I gave you an overview of uh, what the ESG issues are and um, Obviously, you can already see that they would relate to the uh, SDGs. And um, there are many different mapping images um, online. I have taken a quick look before our sharing today. And um, there are many different ones. And I, I'm not sure um, all of them would uh, provide a complete picture, but I'm um, just using two as examples. So here, there is one where you see the 17 goals are listed out and they try to show uh, how each of them uh, relate to environment, social and governance. So as I share, share earlier on, I think governance actually underlie all of them because it is the decision making process of a uh, company. So if I were to make this, um, the black would be in all of these goals. And of course, we also know very well that um, to end poverty, climate, uh, climate change is also one key factor that we need to address. So again, even under one or zero hunger, um, it cannot but just be social. It also should have environment. But I think um, this is a, one helpful chart that can help us think about how actually all 17 goals and ESG, they're completely uh, interlinked. And maybe each of us here uh, may have a slightly different interpretation of how they would, the proportion would go. Um, I think one uh, help, more helpful uh, way of thinking how the two link would be something like this. Um, of course, again, um, if I were to define this, governance would highlight both uh, environmental and social. So their overlapping would be bigger, but um, here is just another uh, illustration of how the 17 goals and the ESG uh, can overlap. Um, so I mentioned that there, so just now I show you that there are overlapping and uh, some, uh, 
similarities. Um, but um, of course, there are huge differences as well. So the SDGs are goals. ESG is more like a way you think about how business uh, should uh, perform. And um, the ESG is now, as I mentioned, about regulations. And um, for regulations to work, actually, if you look at global regulations right now, um, a lot of times they're really focused on disclosure, what companies are disclosing. So um, in that sense, um, it is a lot more about standards and, and thresholds and, and methodology. And so that's why I think uh, indicators. So um, what do you mean by uh, you're doing well in relation to your labor management? What, do you, what does it mean uh, that you're doing well in relation to your uh, internal uh, governance structure and your diversity and inclusion policies. Um, the S is actually one of the toughest within the, it's not one of it, it is the toughest in the ESG. As you can see that there are many reports uh, in recent year that talks about putting the S back in the ESG. And reason being, of course, unlike uh, the E, which is now very heavily dominated by the climate change discussion, um, and perhaps there, there is one very clear indicator, which is um, carbon emission. When it comes to the S, there are so many issues, right? From labor uh, to uh, your employ employee relationship, the supply chain to the community that you work in, that your business works in, which is more the traditional uh, business and human rights issues, um, there's so many different issues and it's oftentimes very complex and very difficult to measure uh, the impact and, um, and link it to your business performance. So what if you breach human rights? How does it impact your performance? Um, whereas when it comes to the environment, increasingly we have figures that show if you breach environmental laws, if your carbon emission, you don't look after it, it may impact your share price, et cetera. So, um, the S has been particularly difficult, but again, I think this is where uh, it is important that we're having this decision because this is where NGOs have already been doing a lot of work to substantiate the ESG, um, uh, the KPIs and the issues. And this is where pro bono can support those NGO in uh, achieving uh, those uh, purposes. And this is just, uh, Bringing it back because um, just now for the SDGs, we talk about how it is the government, the business, um, that they all have a role to play civil society. And when we think about ESG, oftentimes we think about it as a business world thing. Um, but this can also work in our favor. And I will agree with Fish that um, actually this is the best timing ever with the momentum that is gaining with ESG. So first of all, regulations, I talked about it already. Um, and then Investing, so sustainable investment, uh, SR20, uh, SR 2021 actually now accounts for one third of uh, global assets and the number is still growing. You may hear uh, sustainable bonds, green bonds, uh, social bonds, um, sustainability linked loans. You just hear a lot of these different financial products out there now. So there is, whether it is driven by uh, a purpose or whether it's driven by regulations or whether it's driven by business opportunities, you see uh, that the uh, sustainable investing pool is growing fast. Um, and then I talk about regulations, but I really wanted to emphasize the growing numbers of ESG related laws. And it may not be called ESG. It could be climate laws. It could be modern slavery. Um, it could be labor. So of course that may cast a net very wide, but again, if we think about, we're trying to substantiate ESG and make companies um, do proper and deep ESG and not just compliance, um, then all these laws will come to, uh, will be part of our toolkit. And so if you just look at climate law alone, um, the number with the LSE Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment, both laws and policies and litigation are just on the rise. And if you read the news, there are just more and more ESG litigation going on. And I know uh, Yoon Jung is the litigator here, so I'll let her share more uh, in a bit. Um, and just a little bit more on policies, you can see the steep rise in uh, ESG related policy, and it's not going to stop because with the Paris Agreement, 
um, and Fish already talk about this, um, that countries are setting climate neutral goals um, or uh, better still if they're setting net zero goals, but uh, the pressure on the climate side is, is real and the urgency is real. And I would say that uh, while this make the E seems to be easier to substantiate, it also helps the S because um, many of us would now uh, are aware of terms and concepts like climate justice or uh, transitional justice. Uh, when we uh, transition to a low carbon economy, people are losing jobs or they need to transition or they are moving because of uh, climate refugees, because of climate change, people's rights are further impacted in the uh, originally already fragile uh, communities. So I think this is there is also a role for us um, who have worked in a human rights space for a long time to highlight and make use of this opportunity with the momentum with climate and ESG to also bring uh, and deepen the human rights uh, discussion. So just a quick wrap up, um, there are, ESG can be the issues. And as I mentioned, there's no global definition, but, uh, but we can have, we, we sort of have some ideas what these would cover. Um, regulations, investment strategies, products are all where these ESG issues are used. But the key is what are the, what are good KPIs and indicators uh, to uh, hold the companies accountable for uh, meeting these goals is actually um, the part where I think we can play the biggest role. And there are so many frameworks and standards out there um, that uh, need this um, deepening and, uh, and substantiation. So I will go into that later in um, when I give examples of how pro bono can support ESG. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Zoe, for your very insightful observations. Uh, you've certainly helped clarify the agenda and what it entails. Um, so now we have our final speaker, Yu Jung who is going to remain focused on the ESGs. Yu Jung, I'd like you to provide us with a regional context, especially from the point of view of government. Please tell us how the ESGs contribute to decision-making by the government. Um, okay. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Yasmin. I'm glad to see you all. I'm Yu Jung. And let me elaborate the meaning of ESG in relation to the government policymaking process. So let me share my, uh, my screen too. Okay. Do you see the screen like Oh, uh, let me stop, stop sharing. I will share it again. Oh, this is working, I guess. Um, so um, I wanted first to point out that ESG until now has been a concept mostly used as an investment framework. However, from my experience and looking into the global trend, ESG is being more and more integrated into the regulation framework, as Zue already pointed out. Because I think it's because ESG poses challenges and opportunities for the government in achieving their own social and environmental policy goals. Um, so what are the relationship between ESG and the government? So I, I hear attached the drawing. Um, you always know, you, are, you already know that the state or the government bear duty to protect human rights. And they, are, they bear also the primary responsibility to implement the sustainable development goals. Bish has pointed out that all of us are responsible for realizing the SDGs. However, the government remains as one of the principal agents of implementing SDGs, as you know. So as the state has such policy goals, the rise of ESG can be an opportunity for the government to induce companies to care more about the environmental and social impact of the operation and like make them commit 
to the responsible business conduct, uh, which respects human rights and sustainable development. So to grasp the opportunity, we can now see several governments trying to redefine the concept of ESG by enacting rules and standards like something Zueo has already mentioned about Hong Kong. So when I was working for the Korean government, the Korean government had something called like KESG index. They published it last year. It is a guidance for companies to implement and disclose information on their ESG practices. Um, uh, the more, uh, more and more Asian countries are doing something like this as well. I heard that Japanese government recently published a guideline on human rights due diligence for the private companies. And I also saw that ASEAN also published a taxonomy. So for your information, taxonomy is an official standard that sets out what kind of corporate activity is sustainable and what is not. So these are, you know, these are government endeavor to set the set standard to really guide or induce the companies towards the responsible business conduct through the framework of ESG. And however, as ESG comes as opportunity for the government to achieve their policy goals, it also poses challenges to them. The real challenge with the ESG for the government is think, is I think is washing. Um, have you have anyone heard of washing or washing problems? If you have heard of it, please raise your hand through emoji. Oh, I see. Uh, I see a few of you have uh, have heard of washing. Uh, washing means when a business creates creates a false impression through branding or marketing that its products and practices are like. We have an environmentally friendly products or practice when they are not, or not to the extent they implied. Um, there is a concept called greenwashing, that greenwashing means that their product or practices are not environmentally friendly as to the extent they have implied. And there is a concept called whitewashing. Whitewashing means the same conduct, but regarding the social impact of the corporation. So in short, in short, to wrap it short, um, in terms of ESG, there is a risk, there is always a risk that companies may end up just superficially committing to the targets, committing to the ESG targets. So the government faces a need to prevent the washing, uh, the prevent the superficial committing to the targets. So um, with the needs to address the challenge, uh, there are several ESG disclosure framework that are set as rules or even legislations in Asian countries. Uh, so the way uh, already mentioned the case of Hong Kong. Hong Kong has a firm ESG disclosure framework, which is very detailed. And recently China also published an ESG disclosure framework. Um, the Korean government is also planning to do so until 2025. And not to mention the regional governments, EU and USA is also setting rules to prevent the washing problem. So wrap up the issue, wrap up the issue, the government uh, has its own concerns. They need to protect human rights, human rights, and they need to like address the environmental impact of the companies. So ESG comes as a chance for them to lead the companies into the responsible business conduct. However, it is not really easy, easy one. So they they are like coming up with several policies to like set the rules and set the standards about the ESG. And I really want to emphasize the role of pro bono legal experts here. You know, um, they, uh, the pro bono legal experts can call for improvement of state policy. They may also call for the alignment of the policies with the international standards. The government, I say, uh, need the participation of pro bono legal experts to do their job properly. You know, you all know that governments do not do their job always properly. <laughs> so I, I think pro bono legal experts really need to engage in the legislative 
conversation to really enhance the role of state in terms of ESG. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Yujun. Um, the perspective uh, that you've provided certainly gives good context to why the ESGs are becoming in increasingly important. Um, so now going back to Vish, uh, my next question for you is that can you please provide us with a few examples of how the SDGs have been embedded in the work that lawyers do? Um, also, could you give some examples of the SDGs and pro bono and how the SDGs can be made to be part of the everyday work of the legal profession? Thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Yasmin. I, um, I have to say I was watching in awe of the two presentations, which were very helpful in actually uh, gathering my thoughts and actually coming to uh, the answer that I hopefully will try to keep it as concise as possible. And uh, this is the third hat that I'm wearing this morning, which is that of being a lawyer uh, and a practitioner uh, that I used to. Uh, you know, you, and I'll, bringing, I'll be bringing in some personal experiences. And I think one of the first things to notice and one of the first things to comment on is the role of law. And I think law has a very interesting dual function where on the one hand, uh, it is reflecting what the societal standards and what the legal provisions are. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also molding what the societal uh, standards and the legal position should be, and which is really where uh, the lawyer's role in the SDGs uh, as well as the ESGs come in. Uh, so I think first, the reflective part on what the current role is, we look at a number of instances where uh, the law has been using uh, to play its part. And I think uh, the way to embed uh, for lawyers is to think of it in two ways. The first one is to look at it inwardly uh, and to be using, for instance, uh, you know, there have been instances where a lot of the legal partners of, including A4ID, they've come on board and they've said, well, we are changing the way uh, we are running our firms. And it could be something as simple as making gender diversity and equality mainstream. And it could be something as logistical as changing the light bulbs uh, that you use in your establishments because you know that's energy saving as well or the way you travel, um, which has an impact on the environment. So you know something as simple as that in sort of an inward looking way. Uh, but I think that's more general rather than just what lawyers can do. Uh, so to come back to what lawyers can do in terms of the outward looking, um, way we see that there are a lot of administrative regulations and law is not just about constitutional rights and not just about the other things and I think the SDGs provide brilliant opportunities where they provide law in two instances the first one being actual uh, you know like pieces of legislation for instance we've just seen in ESGs and I'll give you an example from India uh, where the government has made corporate social responsibility um, something that's mandatory where uh, all companies have to plow back into the um, into the resources that they extract from. And I think the wording is quite interesting and it's also quite significant because it's not philanthropy. You know, it's responsibility that the companies owe uh, to uh, the, the society that they are using the resources from, be it human resources or other uh, resources as well. Uh, so I think one of the ways in which lawyers can equip companies is to be very vigilant and very, very active in providing legal advice when asked what are the sort of contributions they can make. And this really is what can be described as a tangible, uh, you know, sort of contribution, because really you are in the thick of it, you are advising and you're giving uh, your, um, you know, expertise in a way that will have an actual contribution to the, uh, the, the problems also that we face. Uh, the other key activities that if I were to break it down into two or three, the three key activities that I would say is that the first thing that the lawyers can do uh, is to learn and to educate, which is really uh, very, very crucial in order to understand what SDGs are, what social responsibility is, what ESGs are, and to make sure that they become a part of the fabric of common understanding of how we are running businesses. And it's important that we are running responsible businesses. Uh, the second is to integrate the various practices. Uh, so SDGs in themselves are not legally binding. Uh, they are not uh, something that can be, um, you know, said to be uh, binding in the sense of the laws. 
uh, but but they they still have a lot of power and there are many domestic uh, uh, regulations and domestic uh, sort of legal frameworks which are being developed to make them a part of domestic laws as well so to interpret them in ways and the third is to act and this could be something as simple as helping in drafting legislation uh, you know where you are making everything that's compliant with the SDG um, uh, legal agenda. The other could be capacity building, where, for instance, some of the work uh, that we uh, have done in the past is training uh, lawyers on uh, labor rights, on issues of employment, on issues of natural resources, etc. And the third is policy advocacy, where we are really pushing uh, to make uh, it a more coherent and a more inclusive growth for everybody. And perhaps the fourth, which uh, is very, very important, uh, is the remedial uh, sort of role that lawyers can play when things are not being done in the way they should be aligned with the SDGs. Uh, lawyers can play a function where they can look out and work out actual remedies that can be used. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. And one of them, uh, again, coming from India, uh, is the uh, case of uh, PUCL versus the Union of India, which was in 2003. And this was a case where the Supreme Court of India said and made it mandatory that the right to food is something that the government must provide for. It becomes a fundamental right. And this is just one of the examples. So uh, right to um, uh, education has been made a fundamental right, right to clean environment has also been made a fundamental right. And you see how the lawyers were really at pivotal roles in ensuring that these rights became fundamental rights. And any, um, you know, derogation from this is um, something that can be fought in the courts as well. Uh, more uh, sort of recently, we also see, uh, for instance, I think we are being joined by some of our colleagues uh, from uh, trust law as well. And one of the reports that they've uh, recently helped in publishing is on, uh, for instance, uh, under trial conditions and under trial populations across the world. You know, these sort of things really help in a number of things. And as I said, SDGs are interlinked. So you have a sort of complete painting on that uh, huge canvas that can be formed. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, we also see that uh, just making it an everyday piece of work, so the inward looking and the outward looking are uh, two things being done simultaneously where you're reflecting, but also molding uh, the way the public standards are run. Uh, and one of the other examples that I'll give is of A4ID's partnership uh, with Tradecraft, where uh, uh, the, 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 the condition of tea workers in the state of Assam was being assessed. And... Uh, uh, you know, we got, uh, and this was all done pro bono by uh, one of our uh, legal partners. And we saw that uh, the legal partner went beyond the call of their duty. And rather than just advising on what the bare minimum was, uh, we were actually able to work out what the gold standard uh, would be of working. And we, um, you know, there was a campaign which was started, which said, who picked my tea uh, campaign, you know, which was quite uh, interesting and it really hit hard because the companies were more and more interested and because the consumer was more and more interested in finding out where their tea was coming from. Uh, the other thing that we've also done is um, issues around uh, worker rights and also issues around uh, you know supplier and buyer rights because they all are part of a bigger system where uh, the supply chain is, um, is is regulated by legal provisions but how is it that we can make them uh, more inclusive uh, so i think uh, the ways in which lawyers can help uh, just to summarize is uh, two ways one is inward looking which as i said could be as uh, simple as uh, looking at the sort of uh, maybe even the cutlery that we use, you know, whether it's environment friendly and where it's coming from, because, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's quite important. Uh, but also outward looking where we are sensitive to the consumer needs. And we've also just established uh, using the ESG models uh, that were brilliantly uh, summarized by Zewi and Yujung about how we see that the consumer demand is now one that needs to be compliant with ESGs, which in turn link with SDGs. Uh, so lawyers have a huge, huge role to play uh, and um, they need to learn and educate, they need to integrate, they need to act. And perhaps most importantly, uh, they also need to be looking at innovative solutions to some of the problems that we are currently facing. Uh, so that's my answer back to you, Yasmin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Vish, for providing us with such great examples. Uh, now, I have a, a three-part question for you, Zaywi, 
and uh, <laughs> I'm yes. sitting in my hotel room at the moment with my door. I think the cleaner is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if I just you can hang on for a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think <laughs> they've gone. Right. Um, so I have a three part question <laughs> for you, Zavi. Please, can you provide us with uh, pro bono um, examples uh, being used to enhance the ESGs and perhaps also outline some of the challenges and some of the opportunities? Um, and also, it would be helpful to hear about the interrelationship between the SDGs, the ESGs, and business and human rights or responsible business, as it's also called. Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Yasmin. So I will give this a second try and hopefully there will be less um, technical difficulty here. Okay, can you see it this time? Yes, we can, okay, thank you. Great. All right, <laughs> one tick. So um, I have been thinking about pro bono for ESG and I definitely think uh, maybe Yun Zhong and I will, will share a little bit more later how of course there is an inherent tension perhaps thinking, well, ESG is helping companies when consumers and investors like how do we play a role here as pro bono lawyers um and there are definitely uh, different ways to do that um so the first one um is materializing the esgs especially the s um and i mentioned that earlier on already and also in response to what yun jung said uh, about the washing so like she talked about greenwashing um ESG washing, there's also rainbow washing. I don't know if you heard of that. And that is um, basically washing in relation to the SDG goals, saying that you're achieving the SDG goals, but you're not. So how do we, uh, how can uh, we help um, materialize these ESG, substantiate them? Um, is the focus of a lot of um, law schools and, and NGOs and civil society already. And as pro bono lawyers, we can work with them. And I will give an example later. Um, the other one is integrating in business operations, which Fish touches on. Um, but that also, um, apart from the uh, general policies that a company has or a law firm, law firm adopts, um, it can also be helping uh, NGOs come up with um, clauses and, and policies that uh, companies can start using in contracts, say that our climate uh, aligned, climate goals aligned, and uh, or having like their articles or their constitutions changed so that the company now uh, publicly uh, commits to uh, considering stakeholders interest. And I will also give an example uh, shortly. Um, and then there are structures. Um, I have myself involved in, uh, in, in a pro bono capacity helping uh, build the early days um, impact investment funds or uh, impact investment funds that are set up by NGOs. So these are uh, complex uh, 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 financial structures, investment fund structures, and um, arguably in the long run, they, 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 should not, uh, they, 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 they should not be pro bono, but in the early days, um, pro bono help is, uh, is needed. Um, and then, of course, there's litigation, which I'll leave it to uh, you, Jun, to cover. Um, example. So one example that I have been involved in is actually helping amend the uh, Articles of Association of a company that wants to uh, openly commit to, uh, to uh, considering stakeholders' interests. So as many of us may, may know, in a lot of countries, uh, the company's law actually require um, a company to maximize profit. And that means putting shareholders' interest above stakeholders' interest. So um, in order to have a company that can openly commit to considering stakeholders' interest, you need a detailed a review of um, that particular country's uh, uh, company law. Um, but in our favor, I think globally, um, there is a movement where increasingly investors like BlackRock's Larry Fink is talking about a sense of purpose. Um, the business roundtable in the US, which is made up of about 200 um, leading companies in the US, they're redefining the purpose of a corporation to uh, promoting an economy that serves all Americans. Um, there is also discussion of stakeholder capitalism at Davos. So there is all these global movement 
that is helping us make an argument that a purpose of company, even if you're thinking about shareholders' interests, you need to think about stakeholders' interests now. So that context is important because, um, as I mentioned, um, in order to change the articles of a company in certain countries or most countries, you need to be able to show that you're aligned with the company's law. And um, B Corps, uh, I don't know how many of us have heard of B Corps in this group. Okay, so um, it is a, a growing group of companies around the world, a uh, couple of uh, 3,000, 4,000 companies now, including some well-known brands here, like um, Illy, uh, Body Shop, Chloe, Patagonia. Um, they openly commit to taking, uh, looking after stakeholders' interest. So when Hong Kong B Corp, uh, B Lab, which is the body that certifies B Corps in Hong Kong, when they want to set out a template articles of association for companies in Hong Kong, uh, me and my firm back then uh, did this pro bono, helping them uh, draft the articles, the um, the standard clauses for their articles, which states. The object of the company now is to create a material positive uh, impact on social and environment alongside uh, financial return. And more importantly, we also need to allow the directors uh, to consider the interests of these stakeholders so they will not be held in breach of their director's duty when it looks like they're not only considering uh, shareholders' interests. So this is one... Uh, one uh, concrete example of pro bono. And then um, I mentioned um, integrating into business uh, operations through the contract clauses. So um, this is actually a, one of my favorite pro bono projects um, in recent years, and it's called the Chancery Lane Project. And this is where you see more than 300 organizations, including many law firms, came together and draft um, climate clauses. There are more than 100 climate clauses, as I can remember, and they are clauses that can go into everything from your lease to your uh, employment contract to your uh, supplier contract. And essentially, they put in uh, content where, say, for example, allow you uh, to link it to uh, executive pay, linking climate goals to executive pay, or allow you to terminate uh, a contract if um, the supplier or if your counterparty fails to meet certain climate goals or um, they, they breach uh, some of the climate related uh, pledges that they made in a contract. So this is a, a, a fully pro bono project and any law firm um, can use and hopefully that they will uh, uh, borrow these clauses and change their uh, uh, template in-house as well. And Likewise, I think these are climate related. Can we do something related to, um, to modern slavery, to diversity and inclusion? Um, there are still um, much room to be explored. And then um, talking about uh, perhaps some, uh, for those of us who work in the ESG space, you may be familiar with the TCFD, which is the Task Force on Climate Related uh, Financial Disclosures, which is uh, a, a, an initiative, very successful one led by um, global central banks, and, and that's why a lot of government are now incorporating the TCFD uh, standards. But when it comes to inequality, there is also this project that is led by several law schools and civil society on hopefully uh, also setting uh, the, the disclosure standards for inequality inequality related information. So remember, I mentioned most of the regulations right now are disclosure based. They are setting standards for what companies need to disclose in relation to ESG uh, factors. So the better information we get the companies to disclose, the better it is, the easier it is for us to really monitor whether these companies are meeting ESG goals. And finally, uh, Yasmin mentioned this earlier on, I am part of this uh, alliance of uh, lawyers that uh, we believe that in, um, in our advice and in our day-to-day -day job, uh, that we should uh, help move clients towards um, a way of economy, uh, economic development that would take care of people and planet. Of course, this is uh, quite a lot, uh, like ambitious goal. How do you do it? Is the concrete steps that we need everyone's um, input to uh, allow us as a legal profession to play a bigger role in this transition. So I will leave it there for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sobi. And I just want to say in terms of what you've just uh, mentioned, the thing is, 
we have to be ambitious for this agenda. We have no choice. Yes. Um, I want to put that quite forcefully, that it's essential that the legal community exactly. play their part. Yes, so the now, urgency of it, um, whether it's climate or social inequality, there is really no time, yes. So finally then to uh, Eugen, um, can I ask you um, the question, in terms of, can you provide us with examples from your experience where pro bono advice has helped in achieving the ESG targets? Oh, thank you, Yasmin. I think Zoe already gave us a really good picture on this. Um, I may elaborate on her presentation with my thoughts on the role of pro bono uh, in ESG uh, in terms of being ambitious. Uh, and let me share my slides again. Um, I think the essence of pro bono work is to represent the voice of rights holders. Um, as Yasmin has mentioned, ESGA is a framework basically for business operations, and it may end up being a bit superficial. So from my experience, I think the pro bono's significant role is to check and balance corporate practices on ESG. Um, they may represent right holders uh, through the litigation, I, litigation. So I wanted to introduce the ESG litigation case from Korean CSO that checks and balance in terms of checks and balance of towards the ESG practices of corporation to give you some idea what pro bono could do about ESG. So have you have any of you heard about a Korean company named SK or an Australian company named Santos? Um, they are like um, energy companies which are really giant and they are drilling natural gas in Australia. Uh, it is called Barossa Gas Project. And both of the company is like, they really outspokenly commit to ESG. Uh, they publish annual sustainability reports. They have announced high level commitment to ESG. So yeah, they are apparently like in the appearance, like good ESG companies. However, when they carried out this project in Australia, Barossa Gas Project, which is basically drilling natural gas in Australia, they inflicted an adverse impact on the indigenous people's rights and the environment. Um, it turned out that they did not consult the indigenous people about their right to environment and culture, etc., which is definitely of their ESG targets and also of the SDG goals. I guess uh, number 12 and 14 and 15 can be related to this issue. And so uh, a Korean CSO and an Australian legal group in cooperation submitted a pro bono case before the Korean court and the Australian court. Um, in the litigation, they pointed out the absence of consultation of to the indigenous people and the adverse environment and social impact of the drilling, drilling projects of these two ESG giants. As a result, um, pu the Public Bank of Korea, uh, named Exim Bank, withdrew the financial support to the gas project. And the two corporations, Santos and SK, uh, temporarily stopped drilling in the region until the Australian court reaches decision. Although the withdrawal, these withdrawal may not be permanent, the indigenous people got to communicate their concerns and complaints to the corporations and before the judicial body. And I believe that could be considered as outcome of a good pro bono work for ESG targets and as well as SDGs goals. So um, to wrap up the point of this case, I believe pro bono can really check and balance the, the companies to get them really get to the ESG targets. And the litigation may be one of the ways. And secondly, on disclosure, and I really believe pro bono lawyers can play a role in monitoring the ESG dis disclosure and call for more transparency or call for more dedication on human rights targets. Um, here I, I am suggesting a case of Facebook uh, to give you some ideas what legal experts could do. As some of you may already be familiar with, 
Facebook and its mother company Meta faced the really powerful allegations that they just let hatred and incite of violence against Muslim in India. Uh, after the report, the Meta, uh, the co corporation operating the Facebook service, uh, disclosed the report, human rights report, uh, saying it had a third party to undertake an independent human rights impact assessment on potential human rights risks in India. So it looks good. It looks good in terms of ESG targets. But the civil society monitored the report and criticized Meta for lack of transparency and leaving the really important issues out. So here's the tweet from India Civil Watch International and also an Indian NGO Internet Freedom Foundation that criticizes the lack of transparency and leaving out the important issue problem of the Meta Human Rights Report. And this led to some international solidarity too. So Amnesty International also came into the issue and um, announced a report that Meta's human rights report ignores the real threat the company poses. And the Article 19 and an NGO based in USA also expressed concerns about the human rights report section in India. Um, in this case, I say, uh, the role of pro bono legal experts was not apparent. Um, however, I think this is the case that gives give us an idea that what pro bono legal experts could do in terms of monitoring transparency. Uh, one of the jobs of lawyers here in Korea, I don't know how it is on the other countries, uh, but lawyers help like help companies to like comply with the disclosure rules, uh, domestic rules. And also they do some jobs about the transparency of this financial disclosure of the companies. So I think it could be one of the legal experts job to monitor the ESG, ESG disclosures from the companies and check the transparency issue and check the materiality issue. So these were the two cases I wanted to present to you. And to wrap up, I believe pro bono can, you know, check and balance the companies to get to the ESG targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene, for a very comprehensive uh, answer. Um, your example regarding Facebook certainly shows how even giant corporations like Facebook can be held to account and ought to be held to account. <clears throat> now, I'm going to turn to um, our, all our participants um, and give you the opportunity, really, to ask questions to our panelists. Uh, we've heard quite a lot from what the panelists have had to say regarding both the SDG agenda and the ESG agenda. Um, but now it's your opportunity um, to also um, ask questions. So if you have questions, can I ask you to please raise your hand and our technical support team will unmute you so that you can ask a question. Um, now, I seem to be at a disadvantage in a way because my screen seems to have frozen and I can't actually see any of the participants. So if the team can switch it so that everyone can see the participants. And if you could, as I say, participants, raise your hand. Um, I will see if I can ask you to ask a question. Are there people raising their hand? Because I can't see anything at all on my screen. It seems to have frozen. Have we got any, um, can anyone tell me, have we got any questions? Not yet, there are, I can't see any hands raised. Okay, um, and I can't see okay. any. I think, all right, somebody's raised their hand. I think I'll leave it to the um, uh, the tech support to unmute them. Ah, yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, Mit Salin. Mit Salin? <laughs> Uh, I'm one yes. of the secretaries, so I'm going to let uh, Miss Lutna Kim Pong go first. Go ahead. Miss Salin, I've got. Oh, no. Um, uh, yes, but uh, I want to let Mrs. Uh, 
Luchana Kim Thong go first. เอ่อสบายดีอาจารย์ลดหน้าเห็นอาจารย์ยกมืออาจารย์มีคําถามบ่เจ้าเจ้าสบายดีอ่าบ่บ่บ่ค่อยว่าเป็นคําถามหรอ
uh, involving Laos uh, law firm. So I, I must admit, I don't know a Laos context specifically, but um, I, I, I wonder if you're talking about like the bigger commercial law firms or the more individual uh, law firm lawyers that I, I know are quite common um, in, 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 in Southeast Asia. Then I think there are also, it comes down to whether they're com commercial law background or litigation background, say for example. So uh, whether they have com commercial legal skills or um, litigation skills, I, I think there are also different ways to get them involved. Um, maybe I'll stop there first. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yujun, do you want to come in or shall we move on to the next question? Uh, I want to really add on briefly. I know okay. that many members from the pro bono community based in Laos is here in this meeting. So I think from my experience, pro bono lawyers work in alliance or work in organizations. And I see many members from the Lao community is here. So maybe today could be the kickstart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now ask um, someone else a question. I've got Loth Chana. Hi, and Atan Lutana. Hello. Would you like to ask your question? I think, uh, I think uh, Lutana already finished uh, her opinion regarding pro bono. So, um, yes, man, there is a question in uh, the chat. Uh, should I read these out? There are two, actually. Yes, if I can't. Yeah, yeah, I know you can't see. So so there is one uh, which is about how do you believe CSOs can contribute to its efforts of law firms to support ESGs, which I think uh, Yudra and I uh, sort of answered just now, but more in a Laos context. Um, the other one is a uh, tips question. How do you encourage um, lawyer law firm to work towards SDG ESG? Um, so like you just said, there are many pro bono lawyers here. They are the, uh, so they definitely could be that uh, Kickstarter. Um, but at the same time, I also think that is important to think, and that's why this is a good timing. It's really one of the, I think is a, is a really good timing for us to ride um, the ESG wave um, because now companies, there are more regulations around the world um, that require ESG disclosure. And many increasingly these ESG uh, requirements are also long arm uh, legislation. So like EU uh, due diligence, supply chain due diligence, uh, mandatory due diligence requirements, they will apply to all companies that interact with e, uh, the European uh, Union. So like if there is a product that is produced in Southeast Asia that would go to Europe, that is, um, you can use the EU legislation uh, and ESG requirement to, to do things uh, where you are. So um, I would really say, um, pro bono aside, ESG, SDGs aside, even your commercial clients have to fulfill these compliance requirements. So it just makes business sense that they have to uh, pay attention to ESG and increasingly um, SDG goals if they want to show that they are taking this seriously and not just checking the box. Thank you. That's perfectly helpful. And Vish, do you want to come in here? Uh, yes, very quickly, I think to answer uh, both the questions and especially the previous question uh, is about the uh, sort of, and I think yesterday I was hearing in one of the uh, sessions that in Laos there are uh, about 250 to 300 registered advocates. Uh, so I think it's a very, um, you know, for the population, that's, uh, that's the number of advocates. And I think it's on all of us to, uh, as I just said, work on partnerships and to make sure that we learn from each other. So uh, we'd be very keen to hear what uh, Lao advocates have to say to the rest of the community and the other way around. So I think uh, the importance of partnerships can't be undermined at all. Uh, with that, I think Gabriella, has a question. Uh, so uh, if in case you yeah. wanted to ask that, and then it'll be back to Yasmin. Go ahead, okay. Gabby. Gabby, do you have a question? Well, yes. I can see you do. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, firstly, um, thank you so much to all of the panelists. I, I think this has been such a helpful and insightful discussion. Very, very good. So thank you. Uh, I have a question actually to any panelist. Um, it might be a difficult one to answer. 
Um, obviously, um, in a, you know, wide range of countries around the world, there's been a real push um, for corporations to be involved in pro bono work. And if, uh, we at the Australian Pro Bono Centre, of course, are trying to drive forward uh, involvement in in-house pro bono work. So in-house lawyers are involved. And I'm just um, interested in uh, whether any of the panellists have observed that corporations are expressly stating uh, in involvement in pro bono legal work uh, as a way uh, to support ESG and uh, particularly S, of course, in ESG. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, Yun Jung, would you like to go first, please? Okay. Um, I cannot think of a, a specific company here, but I I think I saw a lot of Korean companies um, like supporting a specific pro bono project to address the specific issue that the pro bono project tackles. However, um, in terms of the general meaning of pro bono, you know, the pro bono work sometimes includes some um, conflicts with the company's interests. So I think um, there is some kind of tension between there, but I have, uh, yes, I have seen examples that on a specific product, pro bono project. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, equally, Vish, about a minute. Yeah, thanks very much. You know, there are a number of examples which a lot of our, our partners have worked on, and I think Tradecraft was one. There are a number of other, um, you know, partners that I'll be happy to uh, share the case studies uh, with you as well, uh, Gabriel, and then we can uh, have a detailed conversation about it, because I think it's important that uh, companies also play their part and are also looking uh, sort of that outward uh, looking, which is more inclusive. Thank you, Vish. And another minute for you, um, JV. Right. Hi, Gabriella. So um, I, I, I think uh, if I have to think of immediately an example of a company uh, counting their pro bono legal as a uh, as say in their own ESG report, I, I, I like you, June. I can't think of one immediately, but um, I do know that. Uh, uh, in-house councils are increasingly quite active um, in uh, the legal pro bono space. And of course, in certain jurisdictions, um, it requires certain design that they will have to work with a law firm, et cetera, because they may not have the practicing certificate. Um, but uh, that technical uh, technicality aside, I'm just looking say the Chancery Lane project, um, there are also companies that are not just law firms like Vodafone, NetWest, like they're also involved there too. So um, I, I I I think there's um, room for us to uh, to uh, to 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 push there for sure and see if these companies they have to do their own ESG reporting. Why not also get their legal involved? Especially, I think ESG is at a stage where um, there's there's definitely a lot of fear of ESG washing. So standard setting. Uh, and the standardization of these standards um, is hugely important. Um, a challenge that is recognized by everyone in the ESG space and lawyers this is what they do so they should um there is a I think this is a definitely a big role and, and, and a convincing reason why uh, lawyers should play a role in this um in this uh ESG pro bono space thanks oh <laughs> Thank may you. I add a, a real kick sorry uh may I add an answer real of kick? course oh. of course about, um, as you mentioned, in-house councils, the in-house councils like Alliance in Korea has held a conference of responsible business conduct and they invited like relevant ministries to the conference. So I have been in the conference. Um, I think in-house lawyers can be an agent that lead their company toward the responsible conduct. Mm -hmm. And they, um, as they uh, participate in the legislative discussion and the internal discussion of the company, they can like, in a way they can do uh, good work for the sustainability. Okay, and then just just one uh, kind of response is the public. The public now are very much aware of companies and what they're doing or what they're not doing. And the, the companies that are very clear about the need to show 
their, if you like, their credentials um, are actually working really quite hard in meaningful ways to um, show that they're delivering on this agenda, both the SDGs and also the ESGs. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop the questions there. Thank you for the others that have put their hands up, but we've not reached you. We have actually almost run out of time. Um, so since we've come to almost the end of the session, one thing does remain clear and that time is passing rapidly as we approach the uh, 2020. Uh, we've learned that the Sustainable Development Goals are a blueprint for collective action. And we've also heard that lawyers are impacting on this agenda from all our speakers. And they're not only impacting, but they're doing so significantly. Um, at A4ID, we've been developing with our law firm and our corporate partners what we can do and what we, uh, what we are developing is what we call the SDG Legal Initiative. The initiative seeks to bridge the gap between the legal profession and the world sustainability objectives and to do so in a really big way. So what we're doing is we're having, this is a call to action in effect, to the global legal community to work towards the achievement of the SDG agenda. It's now more important than ever that lawyers use their skills to advance positive global change. Our SDG legal initiative aims to start a movement where the world's entire legal profession firstly learns about the sustainable development goals by raising awareness of the goals, and we're going to do that. Secondly, understands the interconnection between the law and development. And thirdly, works to achieve the SDGs like only lawyers know how. And more than any other profession, in my view, lawyers know how. Lawyers know how to problem solve. We, are, we know that lawyers are great problem solvers. Lawyers know how to use the law and change the law for the greater good. Lawyers know how to influence. If a profession has influence, it's the legal community. Lawyers can influence their CEOs, their boards, and the politicians that govern us. Lawyers can get things done on a massive scale with significant benefit for large numbers of people. So in short, A4ID will provide the legal community with the knowledge and opportunities to take practical action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. And I invite you to join us. Think about it. And after you do, please get in touch. So, uh, Vish, uh, can I ask you to share our link on the, uh, of our website, please? So finally, I want to thank all the organizers Fabsicle, the technical support team and secretariat, uh, also the Landmark Hotel, and for my um, for the people trying to get into my room for leaving me alone. Um, and I'd like to thank all of them for their warm hospitality. And I'd also like to thank our wonderful panelists, Vish, Zeiji, and Yujung, for their insightful contributions. So shall we thank them in the traditional way with a round of applause? And a very big thank you to all of you, our participants. You've been absolutely fantastic for your contributions and also above all for your generosity of spirit. I hope you found the session useful and I hope you get in touch. So a very big thank you from us all and I now close the session. I hope bang on time. Yeah, okay, thank you. On behalf of the Secretariat, we also thank you on the presentation and uh, for the participant. And before go, we have a magic words for the participant to who will, uh, would like to get the certificate, please uh, remember or uh, write in the notes. Yeah, the magic words for this session is Accept to test it. Yes.
Okay, thank you, everyone. Can I just say a very big thank you? I thought yeah, you were yeah. all brilliant, absolutely incredible. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure working with all of you. Um, I do hope our paths cross. Um, I would say, um, actually, in terms of the B Corporation, I'd really be keen to talk to you about that um, in terms of uh, what we're doing with the legal initiative. So perhaps um, we could, uh, we'll touch base and I'll be in touch with you if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to also say well done session. Thank you. And thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 I can't.